Today we're going to talk about uh, edge, AI, and energy. Um, today I have a couple of distinguished guests with me. Uh, but before I introduce them, I'll introduce myself. My name is Blake Kerrigan. So I manage the uh, edge computing practice at Lenovo. So at Lenovo, we do a lot of different things. Uh, but one of probably the fastest growing uh, businesses, aside from our AI practice, is our edge computing practice. And uh, today, I'm joined by Sam Harrell, who's already had an introduction. But maybe I'll let Sam introduce himself. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Sam Harrell here. I am part of Intel's um, Energy Center of Excellence. Um, and uh, pleased to be here and, and, and happy to have a dis discussion. Absolutely. And then I've got my distinguished colleague over here, Mike Leach, from our workstation team. Mike, tell us Thank a little bit about what you do at uh, Lenovo. Yeah, so, so I'm senior manager. Uh, okay, Lenovo, we make an awful lot of products. Um, but it's my role within the workstation business unit uh, of putting the right tools in the hands of the right people for the right jobs, the right tasks. Excellent. Um, and we build innovative kind of solutions based on customer pain points worldwide. Yeah, so Mike has some of the coolest uh, products that most people within the company want to get their hands on. Right. Um, so look, uh, today we're talking about edge, AI, and energy. And I think more specifically, and it's probably fitting, uh, is oil and gas. So not only just uh, from the exploration all the way to the production and the manufacturing or the refining of, of those, uh, those natural resources. And, um, you know, we thought it'd be a good idea to maybe talk about a little bit of the practical applications of, of both edge and AI uh, in that, you know, same line of thinking. So, um, first I want to start with Mike. So, when our customers, you know, these, we're talking about global Fortune 500 companies, uh, blue chip stocks, when they go to place bets in the oil and gas industry, right? So, uh, when they decide, hey, we're going to put a well here, or we're going to drill a hole here into the earth <laughs> and hope for uh, resources. Uh, it's not that simple, right? So, so Mike, um, our customers are leveraging our workstation yeah. technology in a couple of different ways. And I thought it'd be interesting to maybe just explore that for a minute. Well, yeah, and it's not just the, the energy sector, really. You know, many businesses now, they're ultimately hedging their bets. They're, they're taking a guess. You know, where do I put the pin in that map? Or where do I get, you know, to get that? And, and it's not... With the power of AI, you rem you're removing an element of that guess. Um, and I think for me, I find that data is the new currency. Right. And if you can trade into company stocks, whether it be in decision makers or you know, other parts of the value chain, if, you, if you're able to deliver more accurate insights faster using the data that is readily available but likely wasted or unused, um, you know, we've seen for the energy sector and oil and gas especially is that, you know, they, they generate massive amounts of data, but it's being able to manipulate and use that in an intelligent way. Um, I mean, chat GPT is kind of the poster child of the month of like, oh, great, AI is going to fix everything. But it's like, you know, we've had this machine learning for, you know, for the best part of a decade or so, but it's people like Intel creating the tools, the technology that underpins that, of being able to then take those massive data silos um, and being able to sort and manipulate those. Um, and within the energy sector for us, it's that real-time machine learning. So our workstations are used quite extensively due to the power and performance they have. They're a desktop supercomputer. So you don't have to rely heavily on maybe expensive cloud resources. You can use large data sets locally, so you can operate in real time. You haven't got to cut projects down to a quarter of the size and then kind of like guess and close your eyes and hope for the best and send it off to procurement. You can make those real time intelligent decisions. And the, the power from Intel, um, you know, the compute power we see from some of our other partners as well, it, it gives the, the AI practitioners, the data scientists now, the, the tools to actually work in a productive manner. Um, so near real-time insight is kind of the outcome. So you remove that guessing game of, um, of hoping for the best based on maybe past predictions or you know, future unknowns. So you're saying that not all AI takes place in the cloud? Is that no. what you're saying? I mean, <laughs> I mean for me, the, the cloud's just somebody else's computer. Um, you know, so whether you choose that to be something you rent or lease from somebody else or something you want to have closer to you, I think now that the the regulatory constraints around data have now just been put under the microscope a lot with AI. Um, you can't just dial up cloud resources and hope for the best. You've got to provide it behind certain types of firewalls or data's got to stay on-prem. 
And a lot of the data, you can't, there's no time to send it to the cloud to be processed to come back. So you have to operate locally. So you know, using a workstation, you know, we have a portfolio of data science workstations, and they're the on-ramp to the data center. You, know, you will get there at some point for some parts of your workflow, but you need to be able to operate much faster, closer to the data. Um, without the penalty then of maybe data egress charges of taking stuff out afterwards. So we like to empower the users, almost no pun intended, but at the coalface really, where sure. the data is being generated, compute on it locally, get the insight you need, and then make the decisions with the most amount of accuracy as you can. Interesting, interesting. So I, you know, when I think about uh, exploration, right, you're dealing with a massive amount of data, right, and then you're you're also trying to visualize it in a, you know, we think about geospatial, it's like how do I visualize this reservoir yeah. that I might, you know, might or might not be able to, you know, find resources in. And I think there's a, a pretty good blend there, right? Yeah, but there is. And again, the workstation's always used for that, the visualization element. Um, but I'd probably throw the question back to you now in terms of AI doesn't just exist in the cloud. Right. Where are you seeing that used within, you know, the edge, the edge arena within the energy sector? Yeah, so you know, we have a every time I think I've got pinned down the ripest opportunity for AI applications at the edge, like I'm I'm surprised. You know, it's it's like every day there's a new application and a new a new field. Um, but a couple of examples that I'll give you. Um, the the first one is, and you know, it's it's specific to oil and gas because it was the first time that it presented itself. Uh, but essentially, what what the, this very large tier one, it was actually a service company, was really looking at, well, how do we increase safety and awareness on a drilling site? So a drilling site can be very hectic. Um, it's a lot of moving parts, a lot of heavy parts, and there's a lot of people that are inserted at very specific points in a process of drilling a well. Um, so basically what we did with this customer is we developed and fine-tuned a model that basically looked at how do I avoid, detect people, right, but then also understand when are safe or unsafe conditions exist in a scenario. So essentially giving, giving them, you know, leveraging a simple RTSP camera, looking at the drilling floor and understanding and having your relevance of, hey, this is a safe place and this is not, right, especially during certain times of the operation. Um, you know, that's a kind of a real world safety. Uh, I always think it's like, uh, you know, it's productivity, it's uh, efficiency, or it's risk. These are the types of outcomes, yeah. business outcomes, that drive you know some of these use cases for customers. Um, but another one is really around like uh, when I think about risk or environmental impact. Uh, another scenario that we've worked with is actually a natural gas natural gas lift station. So where they're basically aggregating a lot of natural gas that comes out of the ground, and they're lifting it. So they're bringing it up to a higher pressure. And what we've done is we've implemented infrared cameras in these sites that are basically looking across the field to detect points of leak detection, which you know, before today was essentially done with an analog sensor. You know, uh, we think of IoT, right? But now we can do that with visually through infrared, um, which is you know, uh, kind of unique, right? So you go from having sensors, thousands of sensors in maybe one location, to maybe having one camera that can detect maybe leaks, uh, mm. maybe uh, venting of, of certain atmospheric gases. Um, and, and the other one is um, around preventative maintenance. And I know we hear this a lot, but you know, how do you leverage the power of AI to uh, predict uh, essentially when you might have failure? So in that same uh, natural gas lift uh, compression site, we're also looking at the compressors themselves. Not only are we taking into account the data that is generated by maybe one of these, you know, probably 3,000 horsepower you know, you know, natural gas lift pumps, um, but we're also taking acoustics now and actually vibration sensors and correlating, you know, is there an anomaly, is there not? Um, so there's a lot more you can tell just by the analog data that you actually pull off of the systems themselves. And these are all real world examples of where, you know, this is kind of blending AI and edge computing because if you were to do all of this in the cloud, right, you're not going to have, you're not going to be able to shut down the rig when you've got somebody there that shouldn't be there or you're not going to be able to prevent a, an ult ultimately a failure in the same scenario. Yeah, solving the problem after it's happened is just... That's right. It's, that's no good to anybody. Yeah. That's right, that's right. So, um, you know, in a sense, we, we've kind of talked a little bit about, you know, exploration or kind of prospecting in my mind is the way I like to think about it. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about kind of the production side of it, which is kind of the nitty gritty, dirty kind of uh, the, the side of the process, right? But there's also this step going from, hey, we've got resources that we've pulled out of the ground, right? And now we're trying to get them to consumers' hands. So you think about logistics, 
uh, you know, the, the, the not only getting it out of the ground, but then we're talking about transport, refinery, and then also that downstream side of it. Um, Sam's got a, a wealth of experience in this, uh, in this space. And, you know, Sam, I know you talk to, a, you know, probably hundreds of customers a week, but this downstream thing is, is one that I think is really interesting. And, you know, how's Intel kind of addressing some of those challenges? It, it, it is interesting. And I, I think the challenge and the opportunity that, that we see is really mirrored in the conversations that we've had both upstream as well as midstream. Um, when you look at the opportunities around leveraging um, things like vision services um, to look at um, equipment um, um, and predictive um, failures within side of a refinery, um, when you look at vision um, um, services to look at things like cracks um, and other faults in, in the system, within the refinery boundary limits. Um, you look at things like technologies in terms of, of camera and visual information for the protection of substations. All of these things are very relevant for that, the refining side of the house. In terms of the processes, um, you know, there's a lot of AI technology going into optimizing from refining into the supply chain aspects of it for forecasting and long-term planning. We see a lot of opportunities there um, in helping optimize the business because it really at the end of the day, it's really about what these tools and technologies will bring in terms of business value. It's not AI for the sake of AI as, <laughs> as, as you've heard um, many of the other speakers um, uh, attest to it is really about how do we drive business value, and that's super important. And I think lastly, when we look at the, um, you, you talked about um, you know, health and safety in terms of worker, it really is about augmenting the performance of, of workers. Um, and AI plays a critical role in certainly edge data and decisioneering at the edge, near edge decisions may play a real um, role in augmenting the, the work activity. Um, and that augmentation is not, again, for just the sake of data, but it's moving these um, decisions and these analytics into applications that are really near and dear to folks that, you know, turn wrenches. Right. Um, and that's work management systems, that's field service and mobility systems, that's collaboration systems that are in austere or remote environments. And so our ability to be able to move those decisions into real-time business processes that may or may not have a human intervention is really where, where the future of this industry is going. Um, and lastly, I'll say this, and that, and that is, one of the other speakers mentioned it takes a, a community and an ecosystem, and it really does. Um, it takes relationships like the one that, that, that we have between Lenovo um, and, and Intel, but it's also a broader ecosystem of players that we have to intercept um, as we go along this journey to make sure that all of that information is being driven in a consistent manner um, as these things are deployed, um, which is a, an entirely different conversation <laughs> when we're talking about deployment and management of edge technologies um, and, and what that means in terms right. of, of you know, future-proofing operations. Yeah, a couple of things you said there that I really like. You know, it's uh, I think number one I'd picked up on was it's not always about automating everything, right? You know, we all hear this term about human in the loop, but it's it's more about maybe human in the loop but out of the process, right? right. We keep people safe. Uh, we make you know more better, more intelligent, more informed decisions. Um, you know, and I think about uh, you touched on the, the last thing I'll mention about uh, what what you talked about was uh, the ecosystem. You know, it takes a village to raise an AI project. I yeah. mean, that's true whether it's exactly. at the edge or in the data center or in the cloud, right? Um, but I think you know one of the things that I think is a little bit unique to Lenovo, or at least what we've been focused on, is kind of building a center of competency around these ISVs. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, when you think about independent software vendor. Um, you know, when it comes to AI, th there's all sorts of performant decisions to make about what types of hardware that your, you know, your, your AI, uh, your inference engine runs on and your applications and different layers of, of whatever project you're trying to accomplish. Um, but one of the things that I think, you know, is really unique to Lenovo is that we, you know, we, we focus on certifying. So when it comes to, you know, not only the companies need to be solvent, but they also need to be, um, you know, th th they need to, 
basically stand up to the test or, or you know, kind of live up to the, the same Lenovo SLA. You know, they need to be available globally. Uh, we've got a lot of great partners here. We've got a great booth over in uh, booth 420, and I'd encourage everybody to, to come along and jo uh, join us in the booth. Um, but maybe before we shift gears uh, to kind of open it up to q and I'd, I'd just maybe flip it back, a quick question around, you know, uh, any advice to people that are adopting AI today that uh, maybe things you should have them have front of mind that they should be thinking about uh, as they move forward in their journey? And I'll go with you, Mike, first, and we'll flip it over to you, okay. Sam. I appreciate it, Blake. I mean, I see it, if I had a dollar for every time that a customer came to me with a pain point, you know, I'd be somewhere else. As nice as the stage is, I could be somewhere else sunning on a beach. But we do see a, a big shift where uh, it's almost like a trifecta of challenges where, you know, AI as the, you know, it's going to solve the world kind of thing comes into the business. The C-suite, you know, they get, they're bought in on AI, so they get blank checks written to go and solve that and implement it, you know, go and imp you know, bring the village to implement it. But they don't involve the IT team. <laughs> Um, because you know, I don't need another laptop or a desktop or my monitor's fine, so the IT team are left out of the hoop. And I think it, we need to make sure that you know, you've got the, the data scientists who are involved in the projects, the C-suite people who are ultimately signing off on the checks and the IT decision makers are kind of all in a room to understand what's going on. Um, because you know, there's, there's costs that need to be, you know, no one's got blank check. No one should have blank checks to write, <laughs> whether they choose to write them or not. But I think it's all about the smarter technology for all, um, but it's being, about, it's being smart with the technology that's available to you and putting the right hand, the right tools in the hands of the right people at the right time for the right cost. Because AI is the stream in to solve the challenges, but it is going to have a, you know, it needs to have a cost structure associated yeah. to it. So it's like bringing in 10 new headcount, then you know, those 10 people are going to have you know, 401ks and other you know, expenses to go fully burdened expenses. AI needs to be seen as, a, as an expense, but then it needs to be managed in a way of, you know, to, to keep constraints on that. Including staffed appropriately, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah totally yeah, understand. You've got to have the right people to then back up. Yeah, you mentioned you know, you know, human out of the loop, but in the process, I'm like, yeah, for every one person that's removed from an automated role because AI's taken their job, I think there's the ability to upskill and train people then to manage those. So rather than have one person every four stations, you've got four AI entities managing that. And you've still got the one person. He's just better skilled and better trained, probably hopefully better paid in the process. Exactly. Um, and I think that's something that businesses need to look at as well. Very cool. Yeah. Sam, well, I mean, advice. Somebody just getting it, started. Because we're not all Fortune 500 companies. Yeah, yeah. With staff, it, it, data it is. Um, uh, look, I, I will say this. Um, the main thing and takeaway, and I've, I've heard this a couple of times already, is one is don't be afraid to fail and reinvent yourself. Um, I, I think that is, that is one of the, the, the things that's important with this, this kind of disruptive technology. I think the second thing that's, that's really critical, and you've touched on this, and, and that is, um, by nature, it changes the way we work. It changes the way people interact with the business, and in, in many situations, it, it changes the entire business model. Um, and we have to be cognizant of that as we plan as organizations of what that future looks like. Um, and by, by that, you can't plan along, alone. Right. You have to have... Um, the village, right? The village. Yeah. That, there you go. That's, that's, <laughs> that's great. Um, you know, a couple of things that come to mind to me, and I, um, this is, it's, it was not my own unique idea, but I think it was great advice from a, a, a good colleague of mine who basically said, you know, when, when he was talking to customers, and we're talking, you know, four or five years ago before we weren't all obsessed with chat GPT and mm -hmm. large language models, uh, but he said, pick a very specific problem to solve first. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you're becoming overwhelmed with, you know, should I be focused on NLP or, or computer vision and, and where can I use it in my organization, but it's, it's pick, you know, one problem that's associated with uh, maybe increasing productivity or performance, yep. uh, reducing overall risk and compliance, or pick something that increases efficiency, right? Yeah. Um, you know, be grounded in what that is and don't get overwhelmed with, you know, the art of the possible. So. Well, yeah, don't, don't fall into the, the, 
the large language model whole and be like, you know, yeah. where can I use it and force it down? You've we got to GPUs, find the pain right? point and work back. Yeah. Back to what Sam says, don't be scared to fail. And for me, fail fast and fail cheap. Yeah. And then no one will ever judge you for it. If you right. can find the mistake and fail quickly, cheaply, and move on to the next one, if you can find that genuine pain point of, and then work back, something that's got typically P&L associated with it pretty quickly, if you can start small and then feed that back up, you'd be surprised then whether you're, I don't know, 10 or 1,000 employees. You, know, you don't have to be Fortune 500. Yeah. I've taken those processes and then, again, it's smarter AI, I guess, not AI for the sake of AI. Make AI sure it's smart and, and there with tangible you know, benefits and, um, and, and everything else that goes with it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, look, um, I appreciate everybody, you know, coming and attending the session. You know, the idea here was that uh, hopefully we could give you some insight to some of the things that we've learned through our own journey um, and learned through some of our customer experiences. Um, we've got a couple of different examples of some of these use cases in our booth here at the show. Um, again, I want to say thanks, Sam and Mike, for uh, coming to the talk. Uh, one last thing is we are, being Lenovo, we have some of the best gear in the world, so we are giving away uh, a tablet in the back here uh, as an appreciation for you guys attending. And, and uh, Oh, you've got it right with you. I have it here. Excellent. So Tab 11 so Pro. So there were raffle tickets being handed out? Yeah. Oh, I guess I'm supposed Am I drawing them? <laughs> All right. Go, Drum Mike. roll, Actually, please. I'm going yeah. to let Mike draw it. He's a lucky <laughs> guy. Okay. Drum roll. You're holding it. All right. Here we are. The winner is Office Depot. Office Depot. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's number 6358321. Anyone? Well, and we have and we have a winner. All right, not wow. a Lenovo or Intel employee? Yeah. All right. No. Excellent. Thank you. Well, again, thank you guys so much for coming to the show. Please come visit us in the booth. I hope you have a wonderful show. We'll be here all week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.